Thank you very much, Roger, and, and um, thank you to everyone for uh, a wonderful past few days uh, that both uh, myself and my wife have had uh, prior to the conference uh, the past couple of days where um, wonderful speakers. Uh, I did learn so much and I'm looking forward to today as well. I'm in a bit of a bind here because I'm first up and all the experts are following and it would have been so much easier for me to hear what they had to say so I could improve or work on my presentation. But what I'm going to talk for the next little while is to sort of serve as a, as a foundation, as a bit of a basis for much of what you'll be hearing later in uh, the day. There will be repetition and uh, as we were discussing amongst ourselves, the repetition is good because it speaks to some foundational or fundamental elements which are important and in fact deserve to be, to be uh, repeated. So my task is to speak about optimizing pulmonary rehabilitation and I fear that, that some of my core messages are going to be a little bit boring, but I'll try and make them interesting in that uh, one of the ways to optimize pulmonary rehabilitation is to start pulmonary rehabilitation. So I'm going to provide a brief overview of the benefits of pulmonary rehabilitation, and there are many, uh, focusing primarily on the COPD population. Going to highlight the fundamental elements from a design point of view of both an effective and a practical pulmonary rehabilitation program, recognizing that there are programs that are very mature, very effective, very uh, long-standing, and there are others that have just started or are just about to start. And then we'll talk a little bit about some potential techniques and practices for further optimizing the benefits and the outcomes for our patients from participation in pulmonary rehabilitation, including combining both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapies. So let's just step back a little bit before we talk about the benefits of pulmonary rehabilitation. What are the benefits of physical activity in the normal population? Because why would we ask or expect less of our patients than we would of the normal population? And this has been summarized quite nicely, uh, reviewed in the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 2006, and it's been elsewhere, including country-specific data. But we know that physical activity has both primary and secondary prevention benefits for all cause and cardiovascular related deaths are decreased with activity. Moreover, the incidence of common chronic diseases, which are increasing, such as diabetes, such as cancer, and in particular uh, colon, breast, prostate as well, and osteoporosis are significantly reduced with activity. And you don't need much exercise for the normal population to realize these benefits. So for instance, about a thousand kilocalories are associated with a 20 to 30 percent reduction in all-cause mortality. And that's sort of where the 30 minutes three or four times a week of increased activity sort of is, is uh, originated from. So that little in a normal population has been associated with a mortality benefit. Half of that, 15 minutes three or four times a week, moderate activity has been shown to be associated with reductions in diabetes, cancers, and in particular colon and breast, and osteoporosis. So in a normal population, exercise is good, not much exercise is necessary to re realize significant benefits. And in fact, it's been looked at in various different ways. I like this work from, from Jonathan Myers, who was published in New England Journal in 2002. And this is a very unique population. These are men who were referred for cardiac stress testing, underwent cardiac stress testing, and they were followed for a period of time with a number of risk factors, including hypertension, COPD, diabetes, smoking, obesity, and hypercholesterolemia. And this is the relative risk of death, 1, 1.5, and 2. For individuals who were fit in dark, light gray, moderately fit with a, a estimated meta of five to eight and then unfit and clear. And what is obvious is for all of these individuals, thousands of them, with various risk factors including COPD, that their correlation with mortality is quite striking with a degree of fitness. So if we focus on pulmonary rehabilitation, we know that activity limitation, shortness of breath, are kind of the two, the two cardinal <coughs> symptoms of COPD. Those are our targets for therapy. And now we're starting to add exacerbations to that, to that bundle. But our patients are short of breath and they can't do what they want to do. So it, it stands to reason that all COPD patients 
all of us should be encouraged to exercise purely for those documented health benefits in the normal population, not only from a mortality point of view, but also reduction of chronic diseases and cancer, although that's not been specifically demonstrated or studied in COPD. But for patients with COPD, pulmonary rehabilitation, and there's a number of references that sort of speak to the unifying message that pulmonary rehabilitation is the most effective strategy for improving dyspnea, activity limitation, and quality of life. And those are all important patient-centered outcomes. So what are the benefits? And again, I've referenced numerous sort of uh, sources for this. Um, it improves exercise capacity. So you will routinely, after a six or seven or eight week program of targeted uh, exercise reconditioning, achieve about a 30 or four, 35 or 40 percent improvement of how far someone can walk. The higher the intensity, the more effective the program, the greater the gains. These are mean differences. It does reduce shortness of breath and it is associated with an improvement in quality of life that is sustained, more so with maintenance programs. Documented reduction in hospitalizations and healthcare utilization. Cost savings. Reduces anxiety and depression. Patients who participate in pulmonary rehabilitation have more mastery over their disease and that's associated with uh, reduction in, in some of the um, uh, um, symptoms associated with anxiety and depression. And in fact, their mastery of the disease process at that time is also improved. The benefits extend beyond the period of training, so there is a legacy effect. However, the, one of the issues that we have to come to grips with is our traditional programming of eight weeks, 10 weeks, six weeks, and so forth, and then we stop and people graduate if they don't continue to exercise, while there is a legacy effect, it eventually is abolished. So benefits from longer programs or maintenance programs are greater, longer lasting than they are with shorter programs. And finally, inferential data, including from the Cochrane review about survival, about a 13% or 17% improvement in survival, particularly for pulmonary rehabilitation following discharge from hospital when the patients were admitted for an acute exacerbation of COPD. So when you look down those list of endpoints, those are all desirable endpoints, not only from our point of view as clinicians, those who are providing the care, but also those who are receiving the care from our patients and their families. And you've seen this before, where COPD, the, the, the pathophysiologic abnormalities, beginning with expiratory flow limitation, our understanding now of some of the physiology in terms of air trapping and hyperinflation, has consequences for the patients. They become short of breath because of that sentinel abnormality in the lung, which then begins to have systemic manifestations, systemic consequences. They don't exercise, they become inactive, and as a result, there's a bundle, there's an add-on of deconditioning, and it's a vicious circle. The fact that they become deconditioned contributes to increased shortness of breath, and it gets worse and worse. And in patients, this, from their point of view, leads to a reduced quality of life. And from a patient's point of view, if they are the phenotype who have frequent exacerbations, those exacerbations specifically, specifically worsen the underlying pathophysiologic abnormalities, the airflow obstruction, contributes to the inactivity, to the shortness of breath, and to the reduced uh, exercise performance, and, and specifically, independently, also contributes to poor related health, quality of life. So they are a target of, of various um, um, abnormalities going on that contribute to, I can't do anything, I have more shortness of breath, and I'm unhappy. Now when we look at what are the contributors to activity limitation, the list is long. Traditionally, we tend to think of respiratory mechanics or gas exchange abnormalities from a respiratory point of view, ventilatory gas exchange. But in addition, dyspnea by itself, depending on its magnitude, can be a signal. Respiratory or peripheral muscle function, and you'll be hearing about that later today as well. Cardiovascular dysfunction or impaired cardiac function relating to reductions or impaired O2 delivery to the working muscles. Uh, unfitness and deconditioning, which is almost universal and the most common reason that we see for these patients, but also provides an opportunity and a target for why pulmonary rehabilitation is so effective. And then finally, comorbid conditions, 
their, our acknowledgement or recognition of the varied and the many comorbid conditions in this disease, some directly related to and others unrelated to COPD is gaining. And then there may be other things such as motivation, uh, technical factors and so forth that can contribute to these, these abnormalities. And this sort of theory of multiple stacked abnormalities contributing to limitation was highlighted in the Canadian Respiratory Journal in our prior COPD guidelines dating back to 2003, where if we look at the relationship between shortness of breath and exercise, in this instance using a modified Borg score from 0 to 7, although it would go up to 10, and endurance exercise just in minutes of how long they exercise. If an individual with COPD were to exercise, they, as exercise progresses, they become short of breath and they would maybe stop here with an exercise duration of perhaps uh, five or six minutes and a modified Borg score of six. If we augment, if they're hypoxemic and we augment oxygen, we may be able to shift that, or bronchodilators rather, sorry, we may be able to shift that curve to the right such that they're able to exercise more and have less shortness of breath. If they are hypoxemic, we may be able to uh, provide a hyperoxic inspirate such that O2 delivery is improved. There are other ways to improve O2 delivery as well though. That may also have an effect on exercise performance, perhaps a reduction in shortness of breath. And then finally, if we look at exercise training or pulmonary rehabilitation, that can also have a, a, a benefit as well. And in fact, at this time postulated, but the data since 2003 has confirmed that this, in fact, theory is correct. <coughs> this is work from Kingston, from Dennis O'Donnell's laboratory. Dr. Peters was the first author, published in Thorax in 2009. And it's a similar sort of graph looking at shortness of breath on the left and leg fatigue on the right. So if we look at a modified Borg score here with exercise duration under circumstances of normal breathing and then we give them a bronchodilator, so acute bronchodilation that would improve the mechanics such that the uh, obstruction is reduced, we have an immediate improvement in how long they can exercise and it's associated with a reduction in shortness of breath. If we then give them a hyperoxic gas inspirate, that also has an effect. And then here we've given them, or, or uh, Dr. Donnell and his colleagues gave them both hyperoxia and a bronchodilator. So look at the difference from here to here, and from a six to a five, and a, uh, uh, this is an ordinal scale, so a difference of one is clinically meaningful to the patient. You've been able to almost double exercise performance recognizing this is in a research laboratory, but double exercise performance by improving lung function, enhancing O2 delivery. If we look at the right, we have a little bit of a different uh, perspective. We have, this is the room air, this is the bronchodilator, this is the hyperoxia, and this is the hyperoxia and the bronchodilator. Certainly they improve exercise, but they get more leg fatigue, which is exactly what you would expect because they're exercising more acutely. So if they had done this experiment with pulmonary rehabilitation as a third one, one would expect that performance would be even further enhanced because this is exactly what it's targeted for, exactly what it's designed for, exactly what it's been shown to, to make a benefit. And this is highlighted in, in uh, this study that was published in CHEST in 2005, Rich Casaburi. Very targeted, very specialized pulmonary rehabilitation, very effective, that was administered for eight weeks in individuals who received short-acting bronchodilators in gray and then a long-acting bronchodilator, in this case it was teotropium, long-acting anticholinergic, for four weeks beforehand, during and then out to a total duration of six months. And what was found is that at the beginning four weeks there was an improvement in exercise duration, this was on a treadmill, of about 16% with the long-acting anticholinergic. And we know that that effect would be maximal at about six or seven or eight weeks. Francois Malte was the first author in work that we published there. Look at what pulmonary rehabilitation did in terms of its magnitude of effect in improving how far someone could walk on a treadmill. This is baseline of about nine or 10 minutes. This would be about 16 minutes. This is about 21 or 22 minutes. And it was preserved out to six months. Again, a greater benefit, the slope is steeper, for those who were on uh, the long-acting bronchodilator, suggesting that those gains in lung function were optimized, utilized, the advantage was taken uh, um, um, 
afforded because of the pulmonary rehabilitation. And there's a, this is a very important study because it has a few important messages. Number one, effective bronchodilation works. Number two, look at what pulmonary rehabilitation can do for your patients. And if you were to offer them, if I can make you walk twice as far, the answer is pretty clear. But perhaps the most important message, and this is for our colleagues as well as our patients, COPD is not irreversible. This is a disease, this is a systemic disease for which there are effective therapies that make a big difference. And what we used to think when I was in training and with many of you who are in training, there wasn't much we can do for these patients, is just not true. And it happens early. This is uh, Theory Truster, out of Belgium, published in Respiratory Medicine. Small number of patients, about 70 with COPD, 30 with control, with activity monitors for six or seven days. This was the control population. This was the number of steps. This is 10,000 steps, the kind of magic 10,000 steps per day. 2,500, 5,000. Gold one, the old gold one. Gold two, 50 to 80 percent. 30 to 50, and less than 30, the number of steps. And there's an incremental sort of decrement in the number of steps that is, uh, correlates with the degree of obstruction as uh, classified by the gold. And if we look here on the bottom graph, this is the time spent in moderate activity. So not just uh, the number of steps, but higher intensity. And there's a further decrement, even with very mild disease, that again, quite, uh, quite a nice sort of stepwise uh, reduction as the disease severity uh, progresses. And there's other data uh, showing not only in the clinical laboratory, but also in the, in the uh, patient environment over a week, that confirms that even mild COPD has implications for activity limitation that patients, and by inference physicians, those who provide care for them, may not fully realize. This is work out of the Copenhagen City Heart Study that was published in 2009, over 2,300 subjects, looking at the risk of COPD admission and mortality over a 20-year period in individuals who were fit, moderate fit, low fitness and very low fitness in terms of their risk of COPD admission. So over that 20 year period, this is about 0.75, this is about 0.4. And then also looking at mortality. This is uh, everybody surviving 0 0.75, 0 0.5, 0 0.25. And a very nice triation is all statistically significant related to activity and mortality and COPD admission. And then finally, the most recent iteration of the gold guidelines that were uh, published online in December 2011, and I think has been highlighted a couple days ago or yesterday, um, maybe not the simplest messaging in terms of how it, it's done, but nonetheless, they've divided their patients into groups A, B, C, D. A is the lowest risk, the lowest intensity for therapy. Uh, D would be the most severe patients, greatest impairment, shortness of breath, highest frequency of exacerbations. And th this is the non-pharmacologic therapies, and they speak to smoking cessation and so forth. Physical activity for all of our patients, but for BCD, pulmonary rehabilitation. So they've moved up, they've lowered the threshold for which pulmonary rehabilitation is recommended. And we've, we've gone past the time when pulmonary rehabilitation becomes optional, uh, uh, i.e., this is the, now the time is that we have to start providing pulmonary rehabilitation, which is going to be very difficult because it's not widely available, but providing it for our patients because it is so effective. And this was also highlighted in our Canadian guidelines. This is from the 2008 publication in the Canadian Respiratory Journal that was specifically targeted to, to family physicians in primary care, but also in 2007 when the uh, source document first came out where we identified patients based on either lung function impairment or dyspnea using the uh, MRC uh, scale throughout the course of disease, both acknowledging, preventing, and treatment acute exacerbation. So sort of similar to what's now been embedded in the gold document. Smoking cessation, exercise, advice, counsel, self-management education, short-acting bronchodilators, long-acting bronchodilators, which are first-line maintenance therapy for mild, moderate, severe, very severe, and then pulmonary rehabilitation. And then part of our messaging to family physicians in Canada was that how many of your patients are on combination inhaled steroid LABA therapy with COPD? And the answer would be about 80% in Canada. 
And we said, well, you know, if you have 80% of your patients here, what percent do you have in pulmonary rehabilitation? And the answer is almost none. And in fact, Roger and his colleagues in, in Toronto have clearly shown that even our capacity in Canada is very minimal, two, three, four percent regarding the, the burden of disease with all the COPD patients. So we have lots of work to do as well, together. So let's now talk about some of the fundamental elements of design of an effective and practical pulmonary rehabilitation program. So what is pulmonary rehabilitation? You know, and I, as I get older, it, it kind of depends on who you ask. Um, which textbook, which article, which guideline document. But a common theme is that it's a multidisciplinary program. So you have the, the right person, the best person, doing the right job. Designed to optimize the physiological, the psychological, and the social outcomes for COPD patients and their caregivers. And when I care for my patients with COPD, I, uh, sometimes it matters less how far they can walk. Sometimes it matters less what their lung function is. The simple fact that they get out of the house. The simple fact that when I see them in the clinic, they said they had a birthday party after the pulmonary rehabilitation class, brings smiles to their face, and some of those endpoints are more important than all the others. A practical definition really depends on program design and intent. So it can be something as simple as group exercise, which is really very minimal, uh, not as effective as a big, comprehensive, dedicated, targeted program. But if, if you, all you have is something simple, you have to start at the beginning. And then you can move, you can try and evolve, you can try and build into something that becomes bigger and better. So the fundamental components are your, are your team members, your, your people. And you need to start with two. Um, you don't have to over-design or, or, or over-engineer a program if you don't have one. Once you have a small program, you want to design and implement and work to make it more effective and bigger. Aerobic exercise, and you're going to hear this later, again and again, is the most important, the most effective, the simplest uh, intervention that we can do. So walking, pedaling, treadmill, task-specific, lower limbs, that's what will help patients walk more. Uh, strength and resistive training is meaningful, it's helpful, it's additive, it enhances outcomes, but not as a sole intervention. So sometimes we're called to, to review programs and we find out that 90% of their effort is on strength or resistive training and they do so little on some of the core fundamentals like walking or cycling or pedaling. So the balance has to be there. We can't forget about the benefits of task-specific lower limb exercise, aerobic exercise. Education really should be done just enough to get them to exercise. So you build in a bit of excitement, flavor, you try and help patients, but again, it shouldn't overpower. It can be very time consuming. It can be very consuming from a human resource point of view, but it does provide flavor. It provides a little bit of excitement and such for patients in your pulmonary rehabilitation to be coming back. And this has been shown in numerous chronic disease programs. And the best example that we have in Canada, for instance, uh, we had about 190 uh, doctors and nurses who were uh, exposed to a smear positive case of pulmonary tuberculosis. And there were recommendations for um, uh, prophylaxis therapy. And of those 190 pillars of society, doctors and nurses, well educated, you know, they know everything, they know the risks and all that, my colleagues, only three of them, only three of them, and this may be unique to where I, where I live, only three of them actually completed the prophylactic therapy. And it's been shown again in other chronic diseases where education by itself is very uh, minimal effect. In combination, together with everything else, it can be additive. The socialization and the psychological support is, a, is beneficial, and you don't have to design that. The patients will do that themselves. They'll start to develop relations with your staff. They'll start to develop relations amongst themselves, and it becomes an outlet, an opportunity for them to, to uh, smile, an opportunity to think and realize that I thought I was bad, wow, Look at, look at Mary, those sorts of things. And then finally, one of the most important things is to, to in a sensible fashion, to evaluate outcomes and, and evaluate your program. Uh, and there are different ways to do it. One can look at sort of the burden, the health cost, uh, you know, what it, what it costs to run your program, but also patient-centered ones, healthcare utilization, uh, something as simple as a six minute walk or quality of life indicators to ensure that your program is effective and doing what it is designed to do. 
Moreover, if you have baseline data, it allows you the opportunity to assess the effect of an intervention. We're now going to do this and see if it makes a difference. If, after implementing a new intervention, it really doesn't make a difference in outputs that are important, you have to say, well, maybe we should stop or maybe we're not doing it the right way. But again, you have that thoughtful conversation. So evaluation is important. It can't be so overwhelming that it gets in the way of the program. So there is some artfulness in how it's done best. The program duration and frequency, again, typically 30 or 40 minutes, at least three times a week for at least six weeks to get the, the, the benefit and, uh, for the patients. And again, longer is better, forever is best, but there's a balance between resources and the burden of, of a number of patients. And, and there is, again, this philosophy of, of patients going through pulmonary rehabilitation and graduating. And, and, and another thought would be, rather than graduating, um, and uh, for instance, in the Calgary Health region, about a, a million people, they had 11 uh, various centers throughout their, their site where they had programs lasting eight weeks. Their duration after graduating from an eight-week program at six months was only 11%. So 90% of their patients stopped exercising. So while very effective, exceedingly effective during that eight-week period, much less effective later on. So our thinking now is that rather that eight week period, rather than becoming graduation, is perhaps kindergarten. And then it leads to lifelong changes and exercise and we have to enable patients, help them do that. The intensity of exercise, again, lots of literature, lots of debate. Greater training, greater physiologic training occurs at higher intensities because it leads to increased blood lactate and there's lots of physiology behind that. Low intensity training, though, may be better for adherence and benefits in a larger population. And in fact, it's easier to manage. So if you have limited resources, if you have a smaller program, if you have a younger program, it's better to start with low intensity and then build up from there as your capacity and expertise enhances as well. And then finally, if you do have a mature program with lots of resources, cardiopulmonary exercise testing can help with those determinations. It doesn't become necessary, but I'll show you an example where it helps to sort of fuel um, uh, the training and optimize it. Similar to what Rich Cassaburi did in his work that was published in 2005. So this is a very common clinical scenario and one that I just briefly discussed a couple days ago. And I'm not going to go through the whole example, but it, it sort of highlights a typical patient that we tend to see. It's a 64-year-old male with COPD. Uh, the medication was uh, uh, increased when the patient was referred for optimization, but the activity really hasn't changed. <coughs> still remains shortness of breath, still can't do more. Uh, nothing to suggest cardiac or other uh, sort of significant comorbid diseases. They're on long-acting bronchodilators and anticholinergic, long-acting beta-2 agonist. Physical exam doesn't show any surprises. ECG, chest x-ray, echocardiogram, no surprises, and so they're referred for pulmonary rehabilitation, quite a common frequent scenario. And when we look at the flow volume curve on a patient like this, you immediately, this is the maximal flow volume curve, breathing all the way out, breathing all the way in. This is the tidal breathing at rest, so they're symptomatic, they will be short of breath, even at rest, and then at end exercise in blue, you can see there's an increase in then expired lung volume here of probably three, 400 mils, and inspired lung volume here is probably seven or 800 mils. There's flow limitation throughout, but there's all this unused capacity that could still be utilized with further exercise. And when I see a flow volume curve like that, and I see a referral to pulmonary rehab, I think to myself, we're gonna be able to allow this patient to exercise more, to fully utilize their, the full maximal mechanical ventilatory constraint that they're not using. But then there are other people. This is a 61-year-old COPD patient who is referred for pulmonary rehabilitation. You've got striking airflow limitation, maximal flow only two liters per second. This is at rest, this is at middle of exercise, and at end exercise in yellow. A little bit different scenario. At the end of exercise, inspired to reserve volume is like 100 or 200 mils. There's dynamic hyperinflation, they're flow limited. What more could we do for this person? There's just no more breathing capacity and so forth. So in someone like this, we have colleagues and others who would think really pulmonary rehabilitation is not going to help. And in fact, when we look at some of the data from cardiopulmonary exercise testing, this is oxygen uptake, maximal oxygen uptake, work rate increasing, predicted maximal work rate. And you can see that 
at the, the, the patient's data is shifted up and to the left, so there's increased exercise inefficiency with significant limitation. And even more enlightening is that when we look at minute ventilation with VCO2, so CO2 production, maximal predicted ventilation, you can see that the curve is shifted up and to the left because of increased dead space ventilation, ventilatory inefficiency, and so forth. And they've achieved their predicted maximal ventilation. But what pulmonary rehabilitation does, and yellow is after rehabilitation, is by not changing the mechanics, by not changing the lung function, we essentially shift their breathing response, their ventilatory response, down to the right. So they're able to exercise longer with the same ventilatory capacity. And in fact, in this case, we achieved an increase in peak oxygen uptake that would be tangible, that the patient would be able to sense and would equate to less shortness of breath at a given exercise workload and more exercise activity. So all of these patients, regardless of why, are able to benefit from pulmonary rehabilitation if they're able to engage it effectively. Now, let's move now to some techniques and practices for further optimizing the benefits and outcomes. And for those of you who are not participating in pulmonary rehabilitation, this is going to be less meaningful. For those of you who have programs or are doing it, this will also be less meaningful because it is still sort of things that are, are uh, hypotheses and things that are discussed in, in, the, in the research setting. But nonetheless, they're interesting and they allow us to move down the path of how we can make pulmonary rehabilitation even more effective. So I just wanted to make the point about adherence. You can't benefit from pulmonary rehabilitation if you're not in pulmonary rehabilitation. This is data from the TORCH trial, almost 6,000 subjects, the pharmacologic intervention in terms of the probability of dying over the three-year study period related to whether you did take more than 80% of your prescribed medication or did not take more than 80% of your prescribed medication. And I think this is a very important sort of concept, not only for pharmacologic therapy, but also for pulmonary rehabilitation. If you are exposed, if you take your pharmacologic medication, you know what, it, it actually does make a difference. This was not cause and effect, this is retrospective post hoc analysis, but quite an impressive sort of uh, relationship. Similarly with pulmonary rehabilitation, if your patients are not in a program, if you don't have a program yet, uh, it makes it difficult to sort of realize from the benefits. Now, so the question is how do we maximize those benefits and outcomes? from the patient's point of view, with limited resources, with limited access, with no program, and, and we have to set priority. And sometimes what we try to do, what we get caught up, is we try to do too much, and when we think about too much or try to do too much, we achieve too little. So that the practical advice, and this is not coming from me, this is what I've heard from people with so much wisdom in the world that have taught me and I've learned over the years, is start at the beginning. Start small, make a difference, and then move towards making a bigger difference. You need to have consideration of the program duration. If your program just lasts for six or eight weeks and does not have a maintenance phase, those benefits will disappear. And so those, that hard work, all those gains you've made will, will fade. And so you also at the same time have to consider how can we enable the patient, how can we help the patient have a legacy effect that goes on forever and ever the whole time that they live with their disease. And then there are ways to optimize the training techniques. And again, if you have the right staff, the best staff dealing with this, they will help you with this. So aerobic versus strength and aerobic. So there is added benefit with resistive or strength training in terms of just aerobic, but aerobic, as I mentioned, is fundamental. The training intensity. While there is less benefit with low intensity training, there still is benefit and less risk of injury or low adherence because of high intensity. Patients don't like to necessarily become hurt or sore after participation in pulmonary rehabilitation, which can easily be done uh, with high intensity programs. So you have to strike a balance. Some of the patients do because they're very competitive, they want to achieve the gains, they, they uh, achieve a charge from that. So you have to sort of personalize <coughs> what you're able to deliver versus what the audience wants. Um, I'm going to show a little bit data on energy conservation, either, either um, um, you know, uh, targeted testing 
or, or uh, in, uh, equivalent of interval training in terms of other respects that may be uh, useful, and then altering inspired gases as well. So this is work that Neil Leaves um, did, and there were others uh, um, uh, that were published uh, from Europe around the same time. This is from 2006, published in the Blue Journal, where they did exercise in the clinical laboratory uh, on a cycle ergometer under four conditions, patients with moderate, moderate, severe, and severe COPD. And these patients, this is a very messy graph, so I'm just going to make it uh, easy. These are patients under room air, exercised, endurance exercise for about 9.24 minutes. When they were administered 100% oxygen, they exercised for 17.48 minutes. When they were administered 80% or 79% helium with room air, they exercised for about 16.42 minutes. And then the combination for about 28 minutes. Acute research setting, so it's not very practical, but it does speak to the, the concepts at least of O2 delivery and the concepts of altering inspired gases, gas density. Um, I uh, did a year with uh, Dick Jones in uh, Edmonton in uh, 2006 on sabbatical and we did a project where we took patients who were in the maintenance phase of pulmonary rehabilitation and did six minute walk tests under those uh, four uh, situations. And these were the six minute walk test distance here under situations of breathing room air Helium hyperoxia, 70% helium, 30% uh, oxygen, 100% oxygen administered through a high flow mask, and then 100% oxygen administered through a high flow nasal mask. Um, I'm utilizing the ATS criteria for the uh, six minute walk test. Now these were trained individuals. Their six minute walk test distance was 497 meters, and their mean FEV1 was, I believe, 51%. And we were able to achieve a signal with helium hyperoxia just in a six minute walk test. And in fact, there was also one with the hyperoxia. Remember, this is not oxygen that someone would be delivered carrying their own oxygen at two or three liters per minute. And the difference was about 36 meters, 44 meters, and 67 meters. So what people would con consider at least uh, uh, significant and probably clinically meaningful. And then in our, our laboratory, Scott Butcher, we looked at the, the peripheral effect of altering those inspired gases and the manifestations or consequences for the peripheral muscles. Here we look at, uh, in our subjects who are able to exercise, this is exercise duration, under room air and hyperoxia helium concentration, and we achieved a 53% improvement in exercise duration. But what we did is we also looked at the muscle function, in this case, the twitch torque pressure of the, of the um, uh, quadriceps muscle, as a percent of resting, under those two situations at, at isotime, so the same duration of exercise. So when the subjects were exercising under, under helium uh, hyperoxia, their maximal twitch torque at that time, or the stress, what the muscles, peripheral muscles were being asked for, were significantly reduced from room air to helium hyperoxia. So the changes in the respiratory system had significant, meaningful, quite meaningful uh, consequences for the peripheral muscles, even in the, uh, even in the research setting and acutely. And then finally, Neil Leaves took his work a little bit farther and uh, quite a, a complicated sort of elegant work where they trained a traditional sort of training program, breathing helium hyperoxia during their training programs. In very complicated graphs, but this essentially in black are the room air subjects and the open circles are the helium hyperoxia. And there's really no change in dyspnea, in leg fatigue, or in heart rate between the two. But what is evident is that the percent of the maximal workload was enhanced breathing helium hyperoxia. This is the exercise duration was increased at the beginning of their training sessions, two, four, six, out to 16 but then there was no change at the end, and then the overall training volume was increased with helium hyperoxia as well. And what they concluded, and what I think is, is probably a practical conclusion, is that in this setting, it really didn't make a difference in where they ended. Rehab with, with room air was effective. Rehab with helium ox, hyperoxia was effective. But the thoughtful uh, interpretation was that maybe the initiation phase could be abbreviated from eight weeks or six weeks to perhaps three or four weeks because they achieved this gain much earlier. And again, that has to be proven and not a very uh, simple situation for which to move forward with. So again, this is Dr. Goldstein's work. 
that was published in Chess in 2008. And I, every time I look at this, I, I think to myself, why didn't I think of this? And then I look at Roger and I understand why I didn't think about this because I'm not Dr. Goldstein. Mm -hmm. But very elegant work, essentially exercising with one leg at a time, targeted training with one leg versus what we would traditionally do, two legs. And this is the two-legged training group and this is the one-legged training group. Up top is the heart rate response before and after. After is the darker circles. Open circles are before, and no real sort of uh, uh, significant difference between the two-legged uh, training and also in the oxygen uptake. But when we look at the one-legged training, and there's much more data sort of to fulfill this, we can see that oxygen uptake, there's a significant enhancement, quite a significant gain from the before and after with the one-legged training. And in fact, the minute ventilation increased here as well. So there was an augmented training. Number two, the consequence for the patient from a symptom point of view and physiolo physiology was less, such that they were able to tolerate more exercise. And as a result, the overall training effect was magnified with less consequence for the patient. So maybe during the break, I'm going to ask Roger what he's done beyond this in terms of, of the program at, at, at West Park. But very elegant work. And then we specifically in the Canadian Thoracic Society looked at optimizing pulmonary rehabilitation and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This was a clinical practice guideline that we published in 2010. And there were a number of questions that we addressed, but one of them was uh, the issue based on uh, some of the work that had come across. And then the Cochrane review, looking at the recommendation of a mortality benefit for implementing a pulmonary rehabilitation soon after training within one month uh, after a hospitalization for an acute exacerbation. And our recommendation at that time, this was utilizing a systematic review evidence-based approach, was that it was strongly recommended that COPD patients undergo pulmonary rehabilitation within one month following AE COPD, acute exacerbation of COPD, due to evidence supporting improved dyspnea, exercise tolerance, and health-related quality of life. And that was a 1B recommendation, strong recommendation with moderate degree of evidence. And then there was a weaker recommendation, level two, um, that also recommended because of reduced hospital admissions and mortality. Now the issue, the practical issue is this is very difficult to implement. We do not meet this target at my institution and I would say most in institutions don't meet this target either. Moreover in the document we said that access and adherence, remember this is Canada, uh, are highlighted as the most significant challenges. There is an immediate urgency for obstacles to be addressed and removed. It is not acceptable for healthcare providers, us, patients, and healthcare systems to accept the status quo, the status quo being that we have very limited access and availability to pulmonary rehabilitation. The benefits really can't be ignored, and that pulmonary rehabilitation must be accepted and implemented as an integral component of COPD management. Barriers to participation in pulmonary rehabilitation and the burdens of therapy for the patients, the cost, the access, and so forth, need to be acknowledged and also be minimized. And there are different ways of doing this. This is our program that we have in our health region where uh, we've in, uh, enveloped it within a chronic disease mo uh, management uh, model, our Live Well program, based on three pillars of pulmonary rehabilitation, exercise, targeted towards the severity of the disease, enhancing uh, care based on optimal guideline-based uh, management, and then finally trying to enhance and build uh, their self-management skills and self-efficacy endpoints from a patient's point of view. And together, it, it does make a difference. It makes a meaningful difference for these patients. Now, I'm not going to speak about some other considerations such as non-invasive ventilation in the setting of pulmonary rehabilitation. There is a signal uh, benefit with CPAP and proportional assist ventilation. Implementation becomes a big issue. Uh, supplemental oxygen will continue to be studied and has been studied. The benefits in a normal population of supplemental oxygen with exercise, you'll get about a two and a half or three or three and a half percent improvement in peak VO2, but what does that mean for a normal individual? Very little. In patients who are hypoxemic, in the laboratory, a significant benefit. The results in real life have been less so when they have to carry and so forth. So I think we need further refinement, further advances in how that oxygen is delivered. Inspiratory muscle training has been shown to enhance inspiratory muscle function but the, the results from a pulmonary rehabilitation from more patient-centered global endpoints have been disappointing. Walking assists such as rollators and so forth um, I think are effective and are starting to be used and our patients have been doing this for many times without our advice. 
And then there's much work, much excitement that has probably been tempered lately looking at hormonal and nutritional supplements, specifically testosterone and creatinine. So I'll close then just summarizing that we've had a very brief overview of the benefits, the substantial benefits of pulmonary rehabilitation in COPD, meaningful benefits that we've talked a little bit about some of the fundamental aspects and design of, of both an effective and a practical pulmonary rehabilitation program, and then lightly touched upon some techniques and practices for potentially optimizing those benefits from pulmonary rehabilitation for our patients. So thank you very much.